Well, good morning, Walden Church. Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up this morning. You, of course, are watching us on YouTube for our Sunday morning sermons, and we're starting a brand new sermon series on the Holy Spirit. And I couldn't be more excited, but before we get into that, I want uh, to tell you something. I've got something to confess to you. Um, my wife and I met on America Online. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, when I marry couples today, I always ask them how they met. And sometimes when they respond, we met online, they typically finish that statement with, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> but Joanna and I were fine with it. We met online. She actually found me and we started off really as pen pals and eventually we'd either fly or drive from Los Angeles to Sacramento to see each other. And I think when it fully hit me, how much I needed her in my life and that we'd get married was perhaps the last time that I drove her to the airport. I got back in my car, I was pulling away, driving down the freeway, and off on my right side, I saw an airplane taking off from the runway, and I'm sure it wasn't hers, right? It probably wasn't hers, but in my heart, I felt like it was hers. And I had this visual of her flying away from me, and I just started crying uncontrollably. I couldn't stop. It was such a sad moment. But at the same time, I was also happy because it meant that I knew, I knew in my heart that we weren't supposed to be apart. And you know, many times Jesus warned his disciples. He said, I'm going to leave you. And he told them that he would die, that he would go back to heaven, that he would return to the Father. And I can only imagine that hearing that news from such a good and close friend just would have been the worst. I mean, Jesus was God in flesh. So his company, his fellowship, just being with him, I, I bet even how he smelled was wonderful. You know, he always drew a crowd. And for those that were close to him, just to be with him in that short time was, was, was wonderful. So to hear that their time together would be brief, I'm sure that wasn't good news. One time when Jesus saw that they were particularly troubled about this, he says in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, and where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. So Jesus says very clearly, I'm leaving, right? I'm going away, but I'll be back. And just know that while I'm gone, right, I'll be working. I'll be building a house for the two of us. I'll be building a place where you and I can live. And the words that Jesus uses here are the same that a groom would say to his bride. So Jesus knew that there would be this time apart between him and us, and he knew that it would hurt. He knew it would be sad. He knew that we would miss each other. Paul writes, about this feeling of, of missing Jesus, of missing heaven. He writes this to the Philippians. He says, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul says, I miss heaven so bad. I miss Jesus so much. And this is coming from a man who'd never been to heaven, <laughs> never met Jesus, but he loved Jesus so much that his heart longed to leave earth to be with him. What about us? Does our heart long for heaven? You could say, well, you know, sure, maybe if I live back then, you know, Paul, Paul didn't have Wi-Fi. He didn't have pickup trucks. He didn't have big TV. 
you know, now, now we've got lots to live for, lots of uh, amenities down here on earth. Really? Or how many of would, would you have said, you know, none of it matters, none of it matters. Jesus, just come back right now. <laughs> I'd, I'd give all of this up for you. Life, life isn't about religion, life isn't about church. It's only about Jesus, and he is the only thing that's important. And the longer there is this separation, the longer that I am apart from him, the more it hurts me. So Jesus reassures, he says, I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. But he even offers more reassurances for us, because he sees that, that we're hurting, he sees that we're sad. John 14, 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. First, Jesus says, just because I'm leaving doesn't mean the miracles and the signs and the wonders that that will stop. In fact, Jesus says, the church is going to do even greater works than I did. So Jesus is offering encouragement, that's encouraging. And then he says, even though I will be in heaven, and that might feel like I'm far away, he says, we can still talk on the phone, <laughs> right? I mean, he says, I'll still be able to hear you. I'll still hear your prayers. So that's nice. I mean, when Joanna would fly home to Los Angeles, talking on the phone was the next best thing for us. We talked on the phone every day. Prayer is supposed to be one of those things that brings us comfort because it brings us closer to God. It allows us to stay connected to God, to feel like we're close. But there's one more assurance. There's one more thing. Jesus gives us even more. In verse 15, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. Did you see that? Jesus said, I'm leaving, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to build you a home, but I'm sending you another, and they're going to keep you company, and they're going to help you. Now, that word for another in the Greek is the same word you'd use if I asked you, um, hey, did, did, you, did you like that cookie? You did? Would you like another? That's how that word is used. It's not the same exact cookie that you had before, right? But it's super close. It was made from the same batch. It's just like the other one, except a little different, but it's indistinguishable. Jesus says, I'm leaving, and I'll leave you with another one just like me. He says, don't worry, it'll be like I never left. Jesus says, I'm sending another. And he says, and they will be a helper. Helper in the Greek is the word paraclete, and it means your encourager, your coach. Jesus says, I'm going away, but don't worry. And then to ease that worry, he sends another in his place. Maybe not physically, right, but spiritually. Jesus says, you can talk to me, I'll listen. You can look for me, and I'll always be with you. That's good, right? Well, I mean, I guess anything's better than nothing. Why do we think that? That, that, that that's better? Do you, think that, do you think that Jesus left this earth to make your life worse? Or, or, or do you think the Holy Spirit could actually be better? I mean, what do you think? Do you really think that better, right? Do you think your life would be better if Jesus were here in the flesh? Better that Jesus would be a physical man that you could see, hear, and touch here on the planet. Is that really better? I mean, sure, we'd all 
love to see Jesus, spend time with him, hear his voice, and perhaps uh, we are all secretly jealous of the disciples. They got to see Jesus, be with Jesus every day. But, I mean, just go with this. If Jesus were here now with us, we would never have a moment with him. What state of the United States would he be in? What country would he be in? You'd have to take a plane to go and visit wherever he was. And then, even if you got near him, he'd be surrounded by thousands of people each and every day. He would never talk to you directly. He would never hear you. You see, this is why when Jesus left us, he left us better with the Holy Spirit. The helper is better. The Holy Spirit gets a bad rap. He's ignored, he's not studied, he's not preached on, he's not prayed to. And yet, this is our gift. <laughs> this is our gift from God. This is our assurance. This is our help. Wouldn't you like some help in your life? Don't you ever feel overwhelmed? Couldn't you use help? Jesus says, hey, I left you help. Couldn't you use a friend? Jesus says, I left you a friend. How did this all happen? Let's start. Let's go back to the beginning. You know, these last few weeks, we've been examining the book of Acts, and we've looked at the early church and how they acted, what they did, and uh, through it all, we've kind of been mentioning the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit giving the early church power, giving the early church strength and confidence and, and faith, and we know that all those things come from the Holy Spirit. So I thought, you know what? Let's just study the Holy Spirit together for a couple of weeks, right? Let's just get into it. Let's just really unpack the Holy Spirit because I don't know that we know. <laughs> I think we think we know, right? But do, but do we? Because listen, I've been here for nine years at this church and it seems like every year we're asking for volunteers and asking for help every year. And it seems like we never have enough volunteers or, or it seems like the same people keep volunteering. So, I mean, that's on me. It is, that really is. As a leader, I take that and I get it. I mean, I know a lot about the Bible. Uh, I might even be a good teacher, but there is a lot more that I need to learn about leadership. And oftentimes I feel like a poor leader. I mean, ask our staff. I make mistakes and I fall short all the time. But see, in any place that I fall short, the Spirit helps. In, in any way I feel inadequate, or in any way I feel unable to accomplish it on my own, the Spirit fills in those gaps. The Spirit helps. And I want each of you to really understand that. We all have a place. We all have a calling in the church. And we all have helps, we all have gifts, and we all have work that we can do. And it begins with understanding this resource that we have within the Holy Spirit of God. So I just want to look at how it all started. Acts chapter 1 starts, And while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So before Jesus left, before he goes to heaven, he told the disciples, I want you to stay right here, right? He says, don't leave. I got something for you. I'm going to go get it, but I need you guys just stay here, okay? So they obeyed. They didn't know it was coming, but they obeyed. Acts chapter 2 says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. You know, when I look at the early church in the book of Acts, and then I look at the American church in 2020, there are a lot of differences. And the biggest difference, I bet, would be that you are smarter. It's true, really. I mean, you know more about the Bible, especially theology. You've, you've heard more sermons. You've sat in more Bible studies than anyone ever who lived during the Bible times, and, and probably more than anyone 
who's ever lived. The amount of information and study that is available to you is incredible. But you know, the early church didn't advance the kingdom that way. They didn't grow the kingdom through head knowledge and internal Bible studies. No, they grew the church because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And they tapped into that spirit power. I mean, we can all make plans, right? We can all have big plans about what we want to accomplish. I have big plans for 2021, right? I am, I am already done with this year. I mean, sure, we'll have fun, we'll have Christmas, but I'm really excited about next year. But at the same time, looking at all of that that has to get done, I can get stressed. I can get stressed because just like anything new uh, that you take on, you have doubts. And then I ask myself, can I really do it? And can we pull it off? Maybe we shouldn't try something new. Maybe we should just keep doing the things we've always done. And then, you know, stress kind of spirals and I get anxiety attacks. And that's typically because I don't, I don't have good stress relievers built into my life that help me deal with stress. That's one of the reasons why I run in the mornings because it helps me release stress. But the other thing, the other thing that I can't forget that I have to remember, that I want you to remember is this. The Bible says in Zechariah 4, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Listen, we can all make great big plans and we can all do a lot of great things for the church. We can accomplish great things for the kingdom, but it won't be by our strength. And it certainly won't be anything that we do alone. Jesus says in John 14, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Jesus says, I'm leaving, but I want you to continue to obey. Don't stop obeying just because I'm gone. And then he says, and then through that love, through that obedience, we will come, right? Not I will come, we will come, and we will make our home with him. So don't freak out. I don't need to stress. I'm not doing this alone. You are not doing this alone. We talked about service last week, right? And service might be scary. You might not understand you know, your, your place in the church or how you fit or, or if you want to volunteer in some place. But the good news is we don't do any of this by our own power. It's not up to us. John 14 says, These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. The Spirit doesn't bring us anxiety. The Spirit doesn't bring us stress. The Spirit brings us peace. The Spirit helps us. You see, don't stress. Don't be scared. You have the living God inside of you. Everything is going to be fine. God is in you. John 14, 17 says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells where? With you and will be in you. He's inside you. He's inside you. And it, that's not hard to understand, right? I mean, I tell you what, it probably was hard to understand for the first people who heard this. It was probably hard to understand for the disciples. It's not hard to understand for a four-year-old. Go ask. Go ask a four-year-old where God lives, and they'll tell you. God lives in me, right? But not only that, God lives in each one of his children, in their, and he's helping them. He's bringing them peace. Why did Jesus leave? Why did Jesus leave us down here? Because that was better. That's why. Because it was better. Everything God does, listen to this, everything God does is for your betterment. We say, why did this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? The answer is to make you better. 
to make you better. John 16, 7 says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. All right? Okay. So let's learn some stuff. <laughs> okay? Let's learn some stuff before we go. John 16, Jesus teaches, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Jesus says, I'm going away, right? We covered that. He says, I'm going away and don't be sad. Don't be sad, okay? And then he says in verse eight, and when he comes, that would be the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So that's the first thing the Holy Spirit does. That's the first job of the Holy Spirit, to convict the world of sin. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. What does the Holy Spirit do? He convicts the world of sin. Have you ever thought to yourself, man, I'm never going to get through to this person. They are never going to understand. I've prayed, I've talked to them. I just, I just don't think you're gonna, they're going to get it. You're probably right but that's still trusting in yourself. But the Bible says, not by might nor by power. It's the Holy Spirit's job. That's, their, that's the Holy Spirit's job to convict the world of sin. Yeah, but you know, there's a lot of sin in the world right now. Oh my goodness. And, and I think God just needs the church. God needs the church to help people see their sin, to point out their flaws, and to, to maybe vote for laws that make people act correctly. No. No. Guess what? Rules don't make people right. Rules don't make people right. Ask any elementary school teacher how, by having strict rules in place in the classroom, made kids behave. <laughs> Do kids still get sent to the principal's office even when there are strict rules? Yes. Do people still go to jail even when there are strict rules? Absolutely. You want to hear the truth? You want to hear the truth? You can't regulate morality. You can't make laws to regulate morality. It'd be nice. I wish that were the case. You can have a law that says don't murder. Has that stopped murdering? Nope. What about assault? You're not supposed to assault people. Do people still get assaulted? All the time. What about vandalism? That's, you know, that's a tiny little thing. Does vandalism still take place? Absolutely. Every single election, whenever the election rolls around, we all start talking about where does the candidate stand on abortion, right? That comes up every election. And Christians always wanna vote for the candidate that is anti-abortion. But even abortion laws don't stop people from having abortions. You can't regulate morality. We can't make people be good. Whose job is it to convict the world of sin? The Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's job. This is the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin. It's very important to remember that. We are not the Holy Spirit. He is the promised gift to the sons and daughters of God, and only he convicts the world to sin. And it's only through his righteousness and his judgment. He does this because it's his work. In fact, my least favorite people are people who try to use guilt and use manipulation to convince somebody of their sin, and they don't even see their own. You and I, we have to stop playing Holy Spirit because he's here. He is here. And if people need to be made to feel guilty, he will do that. That's his job. And you might say, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've, I've heard some pastors make their entire church feel guilty. I have too. But I promise you, they can't do it like the Holy Spirit can. And if we keep reading, 
What does it say? John 16, verse 8 says, When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. See, there's the thing. That's why you can't regulate morality. People don't believe in God. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The Greek word here uh, for, for convict, that the Holy Spirit convicts the world, it means to expose it, to rebuke it, to convince them, to prove that they are guilty. So the Spirit does this, not just to point out our sin, right? But rather he brings us to this undeniable realization that we are also ashamed of our sin and that we feel guilt. Because conviction of sin occurs when we see ourselves in comparison to that which is perfect. You know, we are so much more convicted of our sin when we compare ourselves in the light of Jesus or in the light of a holy God. In other words, when we're exposed, when we stand before God's presence, then we see who we are. We see ourselves for who we really are. In all of our sinfulness, we are completely undone. This is what happened to the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, he has a vision. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him were angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. In this passage, Isaiah says, Woe is me. Woe to me. I am ruined, he says. He says the word woe, which in the Hebrew is the word oi. Oi is translated as, I am in trouble. <laughs> oi means I, I am in trouble. This is a strong word in the Hebrew, but Isaiah also says that he is ruined. The Hebrew word for ruined has a very strong meaning too, and it means undone. It means, I means I stand in silence. It means I'm completely destroyed. In Isaiah 6.5, Isaiah is literally saying that he is devastated. And remember, Isaiah is a prophet of God. Isaiah is probably the most righteous man in all of Israel, probably the most righteous man who ever lived. And yet when he stands in light of God, when he is found in God's presence, all he can see in himself is his own depravity. He is completely devastated in the presence of God. He sees all this sin in his life. Isaiah would later go on to write, all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteousness acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. There is this idea that is going around, has always been here, that if you and I are just basically good, right, we get to go to heaven. I'm a good person. But that's a lie. I am sure that Isaiah was more righteous and more good than any living person today. Nevertheless, even when Isaiah saw the totality of all his sin, he didn't say to himself, yeah, but, you know, it all balances out. I'm still a good person. He was totally devastated by it. And sure, we will never have a vision of heaven like Isaiah. But the Holy Spirit is here, and the Holy Spirit can show us the things that Isaiah saw, the, the depravity of our sin. And when we realize that truth, then we become more and more convicted of verses like Romans 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we'll say, yep, that's me. I admit it, that's me. And then we begin to find truth. When you're convicted of that sin, then that puts you on a path to find the answer, to find the truth. And the good news is, that's also the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit guides us 
to truth. If you continue to read verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Jesus knew that his disciples would be lost when he left. He knew they'd be confused. He knew they'd be sad. So he wanted to reassure them, and the Holy Spirit came into their life to give them direction. They needed that path. Remember, the, Holy, the, the disciples didn't have a nice, leather-bound, fully, you know, completed version of the Bible that they could just go to and read whenever they wanted. And so to have truth available to them, that had to be part of what the Spirit offers. You and I, we have truth, we have the Word of God, we can read it whenever we want. But for them, the Holy Spirit had to guide them. Just like it says in Psalm 23, he guides in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But our problem is we don't take the time to listen to that direction. We don't take the time to listen to our helper. We think that we can guide our own life. We think that we can run our own life, run our own church. And that's what gets us into trouble. We run our lives the way we want. We run our families the way we want. We run our church the way we want. And we never ask for or look for the help that the Spirit offers. Why do we need truth? Because we live in a culture that is quickly losing any understanding of objective truth because everything now is relative. We'll say, oh, you know what, that, that's, that's true for you. You know, that's how you perceive things. That's, that, that might help you. You might believe that. You know, that might work for you, but that's not true for me. This is why the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin and then guides them to truth. You need to see the error of your ways and then be guided towards the thing that you really should believe. What else? John 16, 14 says, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. What else does the Spirit do? He glorifies God. This is, this is the job, okay? These are the jobs of the Holy Spirit. I know for the longest time we have been convinced that it's the church's job, that it's our job. Our job to point out sin in the world. Our job to convict people of sin. Our job to show people truth. Our job to worship God. Those are all the jobs of the Holy Spirit. It's his job. Okay? And the best way I can describe this is from another pastor. <laughs> uh, my favorite pastor, uh, one of my favorite pastors is J.I. Packer. J.I. Packer wrote uh, about his thoughts about the Holy Spirit in one of his books. He said, I remember walking to church one winter evening, and he, I was going to preach on John 16, 14, the passage we just read, the words, he will glorify me. And you know, seeing the building floodlit as I turned a corner and realizing that this was exactly the illustration my sermon needed. When floodlighting is well done, the floodlights are placed so that you don't see them. In fact, you're not supposed to see where the light is coming from. What you're meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are trained. The intended effect is to make it visible while otherwise it would not be seen because of the darkness. And so to maximize its dignity by throwing all its details into relief so that you can see it properly. This perfectly illustrated the Spirit's covenant role. He is, so to speak, the hidden floodlight shining on our Savior. And you know, when we come to church, we always feel like it's our job to worship, right? Why am I here? I'm here to worship. I have to worship God, right? Nobody else is going to do it. I have to do it. So that we feel it's the church's job to illuminate God to the world. And for sure, for sure, the church is an instrument. Absolutely. We, but we get to be used. We get to be used, but it's the Holy Spirit's job. It's the Holy Spirit's job. So this is our big misunderstanding. And this is our takeaway for today, okay? We've always been led to believe that it's our job to convict the world of sin, that it's my job to point people to truth, it's my job to worship God, but those are all the jobs of the Holy Spirit. Those are his jobs. 
Why? So that the Holy Spirit gets all the glory. If I did any of those things on my own power, then I could say, I did that. I convicted that person. I led them to truth. I worshiped God. The glory does not belong to us. Why? Because like Isaiah says, I am inadequate. I am so inadequate. I can't do this. Woe is me. I am ruined. Right? I I can't worship God. I am a man of unclean lips. God knows my sin. God knows my depravity. You think he's happy when he sees how I act during the week and then he hears praises come out of my mouth on Sunday? He knows the real me. I am inadequate. Woe is me. I am not a good pastor. I am not a good preacher. I am not a good friend. I am not a good husband. I am not a good father. I'm not. I can't even help my kids with their homework anymore. My son already knows more about math than I do. Both of them. One of them seven. And if in the process of all of this, if I do a little bit of good, right, and I do get noticed, great, all the glory goes to God. All the glory goes to God. And if not, you know what? That's okay too, because that's not my job. The point is Jesus gets glorified in our life. Jesus gets glorified in our life through our work alongside the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through us because it's the glory of Jesus. That is what the world is seeking. The world is not seeking me. The world is not seeking this church. The world is seeking Jesus. The world needs Jesus and they need genuine holiness. The world needs genuine righteousness, genuine forgiveness, genuine mercy. And it's only going to find that from Jesus. So the Holy Spirit shines that light on Jesus. We get to help. We get to hold the light, right? We get to hold the light. That's our part. The function of the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin, lead us in the footsteps of Jesus, lead us to truth, and to assist us as we worship God. So what do we do? We pray for the outpouring. That's what we do. We pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you prayed to the Holy Spirit, that you prayed to your helper. You prayed to the one who gives you strength. Prayed to the one who gives you the faith. Prayed to the one who lives inside of you, that helps you talk to God through prayer. We, we need to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this church. We need to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this community. Something huge is coming in the global church. Can you feel it? There there is going to be a movement in the coming years. You can just feel it. We need to pray for the Spirit's outpouring. That fires will once again be ignited over the sons and daughters of Jesus. That we'll be fueled by that passion, to go out into the world and love it. Don't be afraid. Does your heart long for heaven? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. May that be my prayer more and more. Holy Spirit, come. Before I begin to pray for the things I want or the things I need or the things that are troubling me, Holy Spirit, come. Because you are my friend. You are the friend that Jesus left me and I need a friend. You are the help that Jesus left me and I need help. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, work through me in this church. May I find my place, the place that you have handpicked just for me. Holy Spirit, come and do a work in my life. Give me the strength and the faith and the courage that I need each and every day to do your will. Holy Spirit, help me to convict a lost world. Lord, work through me to guide people to truth. Lord, speak and sing through me when I worship. If I raise my hands, if I fall to my knees, 
if I realize through a worship song in my total depravity that I am so unworthy of you, Lord. This time that I spend here, it's so, so short. It's too short. Church, this time with you is too short. I miss heaven and I miss you and I would do anything, anything to be with you. My heart breaks. My soul misses. My life loves. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Fill each one of us. Pour out of this church. Burst through windows and doors and spell out into neighborhoods. Equip each person to do your will. To spread your word. To show love. We thank you for your, your good graces. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for each and everything that you've poured into us. And we give it all back to you in service. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for spending time with us this morning. And of course, this is a YouTube video that has a address up at the top, a URL. You can always clip and copy that and post it to your own uh, social media wall so that other people can see uh, where you go to church or the things that inspire you. Or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think it might encourage them. Uh, I love you guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.